And I'm going to reflect on, if you like, thinking forward to the future for research for women's health. And for some of you, I'm sure this is relatively well known. And for others, maybe it will make you think about the future for research in women's health. And a lot of what I'm going to say has already been touched on by various other speakers, but hopefully it won't, it, it won't be damaged by repetition. And also, I may give a, diff, a slightly different slant on it and a different view. And I may make you disagree with me strongly about the future for research in women's health, but that's fine. Um, we will see what happens as we move forward with this agenda. Um, but there's lots to think about and lots to consider and lots of opportunities. So I'll apologise first of all that most of the research that I've done, so most of my experience in all of the research that I've done over the years, has been on, in, in, in interventions. And we've had quite a lot about interventions, but if I forget all the work that we need to do and can do in terms of etiology, etiological research, then I apologise. I will try and touch on it a little. But my perspective tends to be from an interventional perspective, either randomised control trials or observational studies of, of interventions. Uh, and it's mostly have a developed country focus, um, partly because of my crippling inability to get on an aeroplane. Uh, my global health uh, career was severely limited, um, as you might imagine. Um, you may ask how I managed to do a very large randomised control, control trial in Kenya, Ghana, Sudan, India, Pakistan, Argentina and Chile for the last 10 years. Well, it's because it's cheaper to fly everybody to London than it is to fly it to any of their host institutions, which makes it much easier for me, because at least I get to see them, even though I've never been to where they work, which is rather challenging. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the questions, how we think about the questions that we want to address by our research. I want to talk a little bit about what parts of the world we might be thinking of in terms of moving forward. I'll talk about partnership working a little and I'll touch on things like practical issues and ethical issues in terms of moving forward and also finishing on the need, I think, for this uh, group, this society to move forward. So what is the questions? I think this is a really interesting one. Sitting on the number of funding panels I do, as I said, mostly within the UK, but I think the, for the clinicians in the audience, there's often an interest in very, very clinically based questions. Is drug X effective in the management of PPH? Is drug X versus drug Y effective in the management of PPH? And I think it would be reasonable to say that a lot of these relatively straightforward questions to answers, answer have been answered. And until there are new interventions to try, this, if you like, low-hanging fruit has almost all been plucked. So the questions by necessity are becoming more complex and more difficult to address. And I think a question like this, which is, is drug act effect, X effective in the management of PPH, also has other benefits because it's often more generalizable. It may rely less on the health system in which the studies are done. Uh, if a drug is effective, it probably is effective in a broader range of settings. Whereas if we're looking at something which is very, very dependent on the health system and the integrity of that health system, that may not translate well at all. So I think we are moving into an area of increasing complexity when we think of those questions. And of course, to an extent, we know what works. We've seen this already. Um, so here's an example from one of uh, the series, the Lancet series. There's a whole list of things that we, um, we know works. And I'll, I'll temper that a little bit and say that we don't always know what works. We often have a good idea about what works. Uh, but um, we don't always. You know, this study that came out in The Lancet recently about antenatal steroids uh, and it not working in these situations and potentially making things worse. Sometimes we cannot just simply say that because it works everywhere else, it will work in the most resource poor settings. Um, sometimes we need to question that. And I'm not saying that this means that we, we throw out everything and start again, but there's no harm in healthy questioning of the existing evidence and seeing whether it's appropriate in different settings. So the steroid one's an, an interesting example. That was the conclusion that they, uh, they drew from that very large trial, which was about implementation of a practice of using steroids. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an experimental trial of giving steroids, not giving steroids. It was increasing implementation of the use of steroids. And of course... You know, if your implementation isn't very good and you're not giving it to the people that need it, then all you get are adverse effects for giving it to people who don't need it. Whole body hypothermia, this is another thing which we have shown very clearly for neonatal encephalopathy in the West, is very effective. It prevents disability, it prevents death, 
And the small scale studies that have been done in some very resource poor settings have suggested that this can increase mortality. And it's probably something to do with the quality of neonatal intensive care. It's probably also to do with the fact that infection plays a much larger role in neonatal ill health. And it may be that whole body hypothermia is not good if you're septic. And of course, in the UK and the US, infection is much less of a problem in neonatology. So we can't necessarily assume that what, we, what is going to work in one country will work in another. And we continually need to question this transferability. Antibiotics. I'm getting very interested in antibiotics. We're just about to start a huge study looking at antibiotics in pregnancy around birth and in the newborn. Uh, in the West, we are becoming more convinced that antibiotics in pregnancy, particularly around birth and in the, and in the first six months after birth, are possibly causal of atopic disease, of asthma, eczema, and other long-term problems, certainly associated with non-communicable diseases in later life. Uh, associated with uh, cardiovascular disease risk, um, the importance of exposure to antibiotics. So I was very interested to hear all this effort this morning about hygiene uh, and how it's important to have clean and safe and sterile delivery. While in this country, we're, I think, getting to the point where we need to throw these babies out in the garden and let them eat worms, um, <laughs> which seems to be good for them. And there's clearly a balance to be made when you're in a very low sepsis environment like the UK, we're probably being a bit too clean. When you're in a very high sepsis environment in some of these countries, we need to get cleaner, but we don't want to go too far the other way. There's a, there's a real balance to be made. But I was very interested in one of the slides this morning, the safe motherhood checklist. At every stage, it said consider giving antibiotics during pregnancy, during birth, to the baby afterwards. We are facing a, a global epidemic of antibiotic resistance, and we need to be very careful about our use of antibiotics. And the stuff that we're doing at the moment, are, we're going to be starting doing very soon. The, the, the theory is that if you, if you apply selection pressure to the mother and alter the mother's microbiome, that transmissible antibiotic resistant bacteria will become established as the norm in their children. And so you can establish a whole reservoir of antibiotic resistance in the next generation of children. Uh, which will then become the normal form of that bacteria. It's all theory at the moment, but it's, it's rather worrying. Anyway, that's a bit of an aside. Um, so we need to think more intelligent, not more intelligent, that implies we've been thick in the past, and I'd like to think that I haven't. But um, we, as we learn more, we need to think about our, our questions and contextualise them and think about all the ramifications of them. The interesting thing, going back to that antibiotic question, the... Even in the UK now, we've changed our practice with antibiotics, prophylactic antibiotics for cesarean section. We used to give them after the cord had been clamped so that the baby got no antibiotics. Now the advice from this college and from NICE is that we try and give them at least an hour before the cesarean section is started. So the baby's got a really, really nice dose of intravenous broad spectrum antibiotics on board when they, fit, when they meet their first bacteria in the world. That's probably not a good idea but it's based on randomised controlled trials that only considered the maternal outcomes of the intervention. So again, thinking of the broader context is going to be quite important. Um, so there remains a need to find out what clinical interventions work and where, and we need to also think about the sustainability of those, the cost of those, the acceptability of those, so thinking more broadly about those contexts, not just, just does drug X, Y, is it going to be affordable? Are people going to be able to implement it? Do women and clinicians find it acceptable? Uh, so those questions are going to continue and persist. But I think they're going to be, there are going to be more and different questions emerging about more complex interventions. Questions that may rely on having a functioning health system uh, uh, or whatever, it is, uh, whatever structure it is. And we need to un understand how to implement uh, uh, what we know works and that means understanding the health systems. That means understanding to barriers to adoption. This is a few years ago now, but I, there was a lovely suite of papers looking at the barriers to implementation of magnesium sulfate for eclampsia. And it was a whole suite of barriers. It was opinion leaders. It was, uh, it was civil service departments not being flexible enough and getting it on the uh, the essential drug list so it couldn't be distributed around the country. There were all sorts of different barriers to implementing what we knew was effective and getting it in there. And that makes, that's a different type of research and a different type of question. Uh, understanding local clinical practices, understanding people's beliefs about health and healthcare, 
I haven't said women there, I've said peoples. In some cultures, women are not the gatekeepers of their health care, their, their husbands or their other family members are. So it's increasing that literacy and understanding that and addressing some of that. And we've heard some of the posters today about people's misbeliefs about their traditional practices. Uh, and also plan evaluation when we plan implementation. If we're going to do implementation, let's plan the evaluation of it. Let's make sure we're doing the right thing. I think we've done lots of things in the past um, and then evaluated it years later and uh, the suggestion is that we've done no good whatsoever but we've spent a lot of money uh, and we've changed lots of things but it's not necessarily giving us the result we want. Um, this, anybody who's done complex interventions, this Bible that the MRC produced now, 15 years ago, I noticed it was 2000, very influential in terms of the evaluation of complex interventions. Is this applicable in a global health setting? How do we do this? There's a lot of work involved in formally evaluating the processes of complex interventions. Um, how we can implement this in these settings is, I think, a challenge. Um, so here's an example, I think. Um, uh, I, I talk about place of birth, because I've always talked about place of birth in the UK. Um, in interesting, we talk about institutional versus home birth, but there's also there's other places of birth. And it's been interesting, we haven't talked much today about different institutional levels and what that means and who delivers care. But anyway, that's an aside. So we know that high unattended home birth rates were associated with high maternal and perinatal mortality. And of course, the, the impression was we needed to get women to hospital. But I remember a time when almost all the funding for research and implementation was about how we get women to hospital. Uh, and almost nothing was done on the other side, which we've heard a lot more about today, which is when the women get to hospital, if the quality of care is rubbish, there's absolutely no point in them going there, or it may be a dangerous place for them to go. And in, in retrospect, it's easy to see, isn't it, that this was a major error in what we were doing. But I don't think it's fair to say that that was entirely predictable. We didn't necessarily think about all the consequences at the time. But there are lessons here to be learned that we need to think about in terms of moving forward with our uh, redesign of healthcare services. Um, health services and other sectors, this has been touched on before. I think um, what are the biggest, biggest determinants of health? They're not the health service. I think the same happened here in every country that went through development. It's having a functioning economy, at the very least to be able to pay wages. There are lots of midwives unpaid in parts of the world or unpaid for long periods of time. Um, water and sanitation, transport infrastructure and the status of women in society, all enormous issues. If we're really serious about improving the health of women, we need to engage with these other sectors. We need to do work which cuts across these sectors to improve the health care of women. We can tinker around the edges, that's a deliberately provocative phrase, about clinical interventions but if women don't get to those healthcare settings, if the staff in those healthcare settings aren't paid or aren't getting any education or CPD or maintaining their skills, then we can, we can talk to Wibbly in the face about what needs to be done, but it's not going to get done. And if it can't be afforded by the healthcare setting, then it won't get done. So there's all sorts of other things we need to think about. I'm not su suggesting we all go off and become economists. And, and lead the finance officers of the ministries, but I think we need to, there are other ways we can engage in, in that. Uh, and I've added climate change at the end, which is becoming more and more topical, although I'm still not quite sure what the implications of that are going to be in terms of health. Uh, and violence against women, it's been touched on, on, on before, and I've mentioned the status of women, but um, violence against women, both uh, physical, psychological, sexual, emotional, and I don't know how to call this social, this, this idea that your family prevent you from seeking help you're having difficulty in labour and your mother-in-law won't let you phone for an ambulance to, or for, to help to take you to the hospital. That, that, that sort of pressure, that family pressure to, to not get what you need. Um, I don't think Richard Horton is here now, but last night at UCL he spoke very passionately about the importance of the health service for dealing with violence against women. That's something we need to think about. I don't, I, I, he didn't go into detail, it's something which I've always thought was a bit of a struggle to think about how the health service, which is there usually as a disease service to pick up the problems, um, but maybe we're talking about secondary prevention, but we need to think more clearly about what the health service can do to identify and maybe prevent violence against women, because I think that's a really big issue. Um, so how are these questions to be asked? Well, where do your questions come from? They come from you, 
you've got an interest in a particular drug or a particular disease area or a particular topic. Um, in this country now, that's okay, but actually we do a lot more border consultation, don't we? Um, anybody taking part in the James Lind Alliance workshop? And the effort that goes into that and the consultation with consumers and the representatives of consumers and patients and their relatives uh, to think about what the, the research priorities are. Are we doing that in any of these other countries? Are there grassroots organisations beginning to represent women in health that we can tap into to find out what the questions are? Will there be a James Lind Alliance equivalent in the Sudan helping us think what the important questions for women are? Um, I don't know. But we just need to think more broadly, I think, about identifying the questions, which is always difficult when we're sitting here in London and talking about a population based uh, a long way away. A lot of talk today about mortality, and I think mortality is really important, and uh, I uh, was infected by Richard and his convergence point. I thought that was a fantastic thing to aim for. But as mortality comes down, then the relative impact of morbidity needs to be taken into account. And we've heard some of that today again about cerebral palsy. The importance of morbidity, and I think therefore the importance of follow-up to assess the full impact of our interventions. I absolutely believe we need to decrease neonatal death and we need to decrease stillbirth. But it cannot be at the cost of increasing severe disability of the children. I don't think. Severely disabled children in very resource poor settings have a terrible quality of life and very, uh, a very, uh, um, and an early death. So what we replace with one, you know, how we, if we increase survival for neonatal encephalopathy, what does that do to increase the disability rates? We just need to be aware of that, which means like in any area of perinatal medicine in particular, we need to follow up to find out what the long-term consequences of our actions are. That caesarean section trial that I've done is looking at caesarean section and the outcomes for the mothers, but we've also then gone back to look three years later to see what outcomes are for the subsequent pregnancies, because that's at least as important. We may decrease their infectious morbidity in the short term, but if we increase their likelihood of having a uterine rupture next time, we're not doing anybody any favours. And we need to know that, and that's really challenging in these settings. Although it's getting substantially better, we got 86% follow-up in our trial because the whole of Africa seems to have mobile phones now, which is fantastic. So even if they move away, you can find them, and particularly if you get their mother's phone number, because um, they can always track them down. So that's all, you know, we're, we're, we've got mechanisms, we're beginning to get mechanisms, but it's really important we know the consequences. We're, we've accepted that now in the UK, we need to accept it globally, I think. And of course, you know, because of my interest and because a lot of the things we talked about today have been around maternal and newborn and child health, we need to think about other aspects of women's health. Cervical cancer, you know, in parts of India there's an established cervical cancer screening programme, but uptake is appalling. And there's no point running a screening programme if uptake, uptake is poor, because it's probably the same as the UK. The women who go for the screening are the ones who don't need it. And the women who really need it are the ones who are not going. So we need to understand why they're not going. What are those barriers and if we can get them into, into that. And of course, you know, we're a global community now, aren't we? Everybody's got access to the internet. So my collaborators on my caesarean section trial, do you know what they want to do next? What's the next big question for them? Infertility. Infertility in a country where we're trying to control fertility. Where the difference between the poor and the rich is very different. Where the burden of unwanted pregnancies is enormous but also the stigma of infertility in these cultures is also enormous. And they want to set up IVF services in parts of the world where you can't get decent coverage for most of the population. And you know, who are we to say whether that's right or wrong? We may have a view about it, but what do we do? How do we help them? What do we try and persuade them that actually they should be thinking about universal coverage for all pregnant women? Or should we set up extremely expensive IVF services for them? and evaluate them. I want to touch on etiological research. I put, a, I put a slide in to remind myself not just to talk about trials. But, you know, I think that this, this landscape is changing as well. Increasing opportunities to address, address complex etiological questions. And partly this is driven by new technological advances. So things like what we can do with blood spots is amazing now, what you can do with a dried blood spot. Uh, and that's easy to collect, easy to store, easy to transport. 
uh, sample volumes are getting less and less and less to do more sophisticated analysis on. Uh, and handling and processing is improving all of the time. Um, and so there are abilities to do very, very complex and, and relatively large scale epidemiological studies uh, with uh, deep phenotyping uh, of these populations uh, to address etiological questions, uh, which will benefit them and may also benefit other parts of the world. Uh, but it's becoming less difficult, I think, than it used to be. So we'll see a lot more of that, I'm quite sure. So I just want to touch on what parts of the world. Well, those with the greatest burden, and what we've heard about today is largely Africa, Southeast Asia, and China, and other, and other parts of the world. But there are other parts of the world where there's actually a little, bit, a little research activity. So I think Andrew Weeks mentioned the fact that there was lots of research activity going, going on in some hospitals to the point where all the good doctors are doing the research and there's nobody left to see the patients anymore. But there are parts of the world where there's very little research going on. Some of the former Soviet countries have got um, huge maternal and perinatal mortalities. Gwyneth was telling me, I can't remember whether it was Uzbekistan, it was, it was something ending in Stan, <laughs> um, which has a maternal mortality of 1,000 per 100,000, 1%. This is now 1% maternal mortality. Uh, and there's very little being done in terms of uh, it being a priority and an area to do research. So there are parts of the country which are wide open, which we need to think about, uh, who would benefit from good research. And again, very different healthcare settings, very different infrastructures, very different views about healthcare, uh, are often a very interventionist healthcare setting, uh, where people are routinely given loads of drugs, even in labour, um, where they use hyperbaric oxygen to treat preeclampsia, uh, in chambers, I mean, you know, bizarre practices that we're not used to, um, but which are not doing the women and the babies any good. And I think this is about generalizability I want to touch on. There's, um, if I, you know, we, we talk about Africa, and people talk about Africa as if it's a single country. Um, you know, we spend our time in London talking about whether the East is very different from the North of London, <laughs> uh, and whether we can generalize results from the Southeast to Scotland. And yet we then, we then group the whole of Africa into this sort of one and homogenous mass, which it clearly isn't. There are very different countries. They have very different challenges. They have very different healthcare systems. And different parts of those countries will have very different challenges and different healthcare systems and different access. So we need to think about that transferability, that generalizability of results away from this idea that we can find something which will apply to everybody. And the more complex the intervention, the more complicated that is to make inferences about those results to other parts of the world. Um, we've seen a picture of a neonatal intensive care unit. I mean, I think just about every country in the world has really sophisticated neonatal intensive, neonatal intensive care units, probably very little provision and probably extremely expensive, so only for the very wealthy. Uh, so the disparity in what is available and what is accessible is great. Um, so I think we need to think about that, this issue about partnership working, and it made me think about what it is we're doing. What are we why are we in the UK? Uh, what are we trying to achieve when we do research in resource poor settings? What is it we're doing? Are we solving our conscience for being so well off and comfortable with such a low perinatal mortality? I would like to think that wasn't what it was. We obviously want to, do, we want to contribute to the help and improving outcomes for women, babies, children, and the, the adults they'll become. Um, but why do we do it? Well, it's partly because somebody usually from outside those countries has to do it because they can't do their own research. They don't have the funding, they often don't have the people, they don't have the facilities. So when we do this research, we also need to think about increasing that capacity for them to do that research. And I absolutely understand, I get that this is not easy. So in my trial, we set up five new trial officers. Uh, we trained all the staff to become trial managers, data managers. We trained them up to very high standards. UK, we wrote the computer program for them that did the data management, but they were responsible for all data cleaning and chasing up in those centres so that they could become a self-sustaining trial office in that big hospital for any subsequent trials that were done, it didn't matter if it was maternal health or care. And for 10 years, I have been trying to make them self-sustaining, and it looks as if only one of them is going to be. Um, 
because of this inability, to, either because of lack of training or lack of opportunity, to, to get funding from nationally or locally to support uh, development of new research capacity. So I know it's challenging, but we must always think about that. Um, uh, I thought I'd just touch on some practical issues very briefly. Challenges of working resource policy. There's all the usual things we think about, all the usual practical issues, poor communication, um, you know, a hospital's, hospital's internet and phone system going down for two days when they're trying to randomise or um, do something that need, they need to do for their research. Um, infrastructural resources, illiteracy when it comes to issues like consent. They're, they're things we know about. But there are other things. There is, there is and you will find corruption and you need to deal with that. You'll find issues to do with competence. I was telling my workshop that um, we now have to do our financial reconciliation for the MRC of our big grant. Um, that's challenging for some of these centres that don't know what a financial reconciliation is and you talk to their head of finance and they don't quite realise what you're asking them. And so when it comes down to saying, but we need to know where the money went, and they go, well, it was spent. Uh, and those expectations and ability to deal with them and cultural expectations are very interesting. So this, we, we opened a new centre in this trial, in, in a centre in Pakistan. Uh, no, uh, yes, it was a centre in Pakistan, and we were able to go to it. It was right at the beginning of the trial. The trial director, the trial manager, and the programme I went out to do a visit to open the centre to find out that the maternity hospital within this hospital had been freshly painted. There was an armed guard to transport them from their hotel. There was a red carpet. There was a trial office which had University of Oxford, MRC, in huge letters over it, and the trial director, in a bemused way, had to cut the ribbon. And everybody from the hospital was there for the opening ceremony of an office. It was really important to them that they were taking part in this international trial funded by the MRC and being run from the University of Oxford. It was a huge sense of pride, which left us rather bemused, but it was clearly terribly important to them. In another centre, there was such pressure to please us that there was fraud. People were making up data um, because they didn't want to return data to us that wasn't complete. Um, this wasn't malicious, but they just were desperate to please this group they saw as being enormously important and influential. So there are always these challenges. We need to think about this. We need to educate them. We need to work with them closely to, make them, to allow them to understand uh, what's necessary and needed. Um, I mean, I'm not going to say much about the ethical issues. They've been, large, they've been debated a lot, and I'm sure you're aware of them, the appropriateness of testing interventions in current countries that cannot implement the intervention if it's a randomised controlled trial. That's, we shouldn't be doing that. This issue about what is standard care, some of that debate seems to have calmed down a bit in recent months, or maybe I'm just naive, but there's quite a lot of issues saying standard care had to be the best care that would be available in the West um, not if you're trying to find something which is implementable in that country and you want to see what the new intervention is compared with standard care in that setting. And issues to do with consent, validity and cultural expectations. And there I'm talking about cultural expectations of clinicians, usually, uh, as opposed to women, because they may have very different views about information giving, the validity of consent, um, which is important. <laughs> And I think this is an, eth an ethical issue, and it's that I've touched on it before about IVF services, but there's increasing technology, and, and countries that can least afford it are using new interventions. They're using ultrasound for whatever purpose. It may be about sex selection of their fetuses, but they're also using it in pregnancy to look at uh, for obstetric purposes. Um, people are using radiotherapy uh, for cervical cancer. Um, and whether we do or do not um, evaluate this, if we don't evaluate it, it will be implemented without evaluation. If we do evaluate it, are we detracting from other aspects of uh, service provision which would do a greater amount of good for a greater number of people? There are always these sort of ethical challenges, I think, in, in working in these settings which we need to consider. And these will all come up as more technology develops and more people, as the technology gets cheaper and more people start adopting it, we'll find it more challenging. So finally, finally, sorry, people are nodding off. It's been a long time. You, but UK Global Health Research, what, why are we here? We're all here because we're clearly interested in global health. But what do we hope to achieve by a group of researchers in the UK? So I'll be a little bit provocative here. 
We're a relatively small community of researchers, I would suggest, in the UK doing global health, with some hugely influential individuals, most of whom are here in this room, and most of whom we've heard speak this morning. So we've certainly got some incredibly powerful and influential individuals pushing forward this agenda. But what is it we hope to achieve as a group? I think if you go onto the international stage and say, what research does the UK do? What global health research is the UK? They'll say, well, Joy does this, and uh, Wendy does that, and it will be individuals. It won't be a view that the UK is a major player in international uh, women's health. And maybe you think that's wrong, but that's the impression I would get. And, and the other thing it's worth saying that, because um, I've heard several of them say this themselves, <laughs> that the senior leaders and opinion leaders are of a certain age. And we need the next generation of researchers to, to, to follow up behind. And I'm now including myself in that group of a certain age. It's so depressing. But, um, you know, there need to be new people to take the reins on. Um, and I think, therefore, we need to think about working more together. We need to, it's always difficult, isn't it? The, the environment we work in is incredibly competitive. But if we're to succeed, we have to work more closely together. This is a great forum. I like the analogy at the morning. Was it Wendy? Everybody was kissing. There was lots of kissing going on. People do know each other. We need to have more kissing, more collaboration, <laughs> less competition. Let's decide what our areas are. What is it we are going to be known at? What is the UK the best at? What is it going to sell? What's, the, what's our niche in the global community of researchers? Where are we going to make our mark? And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do anything else, but what is it we're going to capitalise on and, and really try and push forward on? Because there is funding available. There's funding in the UK. There's plenty of funding available for some really good ideas um, and to get ourselves established as a, as a group of global health researchers. So I think this conference is a really good way of bringing us all together. Many of you will work or be intermittently in and out of the country, so once a year seems like enough. But this, I think, is a fantastic opportunity, and this has got better attended as the years have gone by, I believe. This has been the best attended so far, so the next one has to be as well attended, and I think we can keep going and go from strength to strength. Because, as Richard said, there are some fantastic opportunities to make a real and sustainable difference. Uh, and we need advocates, and we need researchers, and you can be both, or you can be one or the other, um, I was conscious while Richard was speaking this morning, I felt hugely inadequate by comparison. But, you know, you do, we all do our bit, we all contribute to this change, this sea change in, in health outcomes. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you.